And thank you very much for giving us a great overview and um, in a timely fashion, so we have some time for these questions. Great. So while we're, we're um, settling in, I have a couple of quick questions, and hopefully the, the rest of the committee will be thinking of things. Um, when might we have the in Haines data on the 24-hour urine collections for sodium? When might those data be available? Today. <laughs> Hot off the press. You'll oh, hear about yeah. it. <laughs> Perfect. So thank you. So that will be available for the committee's deliberation. Um, sort of the same uh, data question related to Canada. Uh, you mentioned that you were going to have new dietary intake data on sodium. When do you think that might be available for the committee's use? Um, so I looked at the draft yesterday for the first time. I, th I think we're probably a, a couple of months away on that. But, uh, okay. but in the foreseeable future. In the foreseeable future, yeah. Wonderful. So this is really good news uh, because one of the things we really hope to have as a committee is, is really new data coming in. Uh, and I'll ask one last question and then ask the committee. Uh, I, the slide that mentioned and uh, the comment that mentioned special issues in the Canadian population that we might consider, I wondered what, what are you thinking of that we, we might not think of as being sort of typically blended between countries? Uh, the little one at the bottom. Oh, okay. There you go. Thank you. Well, I th uh, there are so many things that are common, like uh, our aging populations and um, uh, obesity, uh, high levels of obesity. But I'm, I'm, I am wondering about the race, ethnicity uh, differences um, and, and whether that might be a factor. And I think Shariki will be talking about that on Friday. Um, so I know you, you will be going really deep into the data. So I think you'll be in a, the best place to determine if, if there are relevant issues in that area. Just to reiterate, or to probe a little further, um, your native population, your indigenous population is organized really quite differently than ours. And I've never really known if we had more populace in the US or Canada. But I think that's one of the areas. And I think often you have more data on those subgroup populations than we do on ours. So I, I hope you'll make sure that we have that and, and we can see that clearly as well. Yes, and I think that's been, um, a, it seems to be a priority for our current government. So we'll be happy to um, give that information. Good, thank you. So I open um, the floor, please. This committee is to consider for the first time chronic disease, uh, DRIs, and I wonder how that is going to impact your recommendations. How are you going to use that as opposed to the upper limits? particularly since there might be a range for the DRIs. When you're talking about any federal agency doing something for the first time, you're not going to get a definitive answer. You know, <laughs> I, I, I really think um, this, this is truly uncharted territory for all of us. Um, I, I think it's going to be you're setting the standard for all future DRI committees on using ranges for um, chronic disease endpoints and going back to something else for upper limits um, that will be a real challenge for the food label especially. So just to clarify again, you were, you were saying that the, the separation of the indicators for upper limit versus the indicators for maybe picking a range for the chronic disease. And that we have no experience in this at all. I got that part. <laughs> other other questions? Um, from, a public policy, uh, from a public policy perspective, sodium in particular, but sodium and potassium and cardiovascular disease have been in the limelight for many, many years, preceding even my government service, which was a long time ago. Um, I just wondered what, in today's context, in today's world, what are the most controversial scientific issues 
that relate to sodium and potassium public policy. And why don't we take those separately unless they have to be conjoined? And I'm going to ask, why don't you talk a little bit about potassium? Because we spent almost all of our time on sodium. So uh, think of that and then go back to the sodium. What are the... No, no one wants to touch this. Um, well, I'll, I'll start with uh, potassium. Um, the, the issue that I hear constantly is there are people with kidney disease that don't know it and will suffer from too much potassium. Um, the, uh, there aren't really valid estimates of what that proportion of the population is. Um, I, I think most people who know they have to restrict, most people who have to restrict potassium already know it. Um, so I'm, and, and I think that there's substantial evidence um, that the, the ratio of sodium to potassium may be just as important than the absolute amounts of either one. And that's another issue that I think the, the committee has to deal with. Um, in, in the past, um, when we did electrolytes, we included chloride also. I don't think there's enough new data on chloride, and so we're not asking you to review that. Um, but as Jin Ann pointed out, we are asking you to um, review both sodium and potassium together. And so the, the issue on sodium, I, I think, is that people look at the same data and have divergent, very different interpretations of those data. Um, and th there's issues regarding the validity of whether spot urines are acceptable, whether 24-hour urines are the gold standard, which has been assumed for decades and probably isn't true um, based on more recent research, that you probably need multiple 24-hour urines for an individual. I don't believe you need them for a population. And that's my personal opinion, not representing USDA at all. Um, so. These are very thorny issues. You know, we have a number of papers in the last couple of years suggesting people with um, heart failure um, actually are harmed by sodium reduction. And I, I think it's up to the committee to interpret those data as, as best they can. And I've said enough. <laughs> yeah. But you've said a lot, and I think, I think you, you've spoken quite well for all of us. But, but as, as you've seen in the presentations to date, what the, the DRIs that come forward are really, they underpin everything that we're, we're doing here. So when there are controversies with respect to any particular nutrient, um, it, it really, it, it's really necessary for us to get to the core of that. And, and just because, again, it, it's, it's right across the board from your basic research, your surveillance, your dietary guidelines, your standards, your regulations. And so we want to make sure that, that we really have the confidence that, we are, that we've got the right information as we are creating those policies and, and everything that fall out of that. Other, other comments on the, that you heard, sort of help the committee focus on what you consider the, the public health? Um, yeah, I, I, just, I would just add and echo some of what has already been said before. Um, that the important, I think, uh, to the extent that there's controversy that that may um, be become apparent uh, or be reflected in some of the presentations. But I would underscore the the importance of uh, of measurement and then uh, interpretation of data as a result of of the measures and um, and and as a result interpreting the the overall um, the overall extent of the evidence, totality of the evidence. Other questions from the committee? Well, I'll, I'll ask one more. Just again, we're picking your brain here a little bit. Um, but I was surprised, happy, but the, uh, to see the potassium is now going to be on the food label. So how, tell us a little bit about how that came about. What was the, the background, the movement to do that? Because that, again, is a, a major public health policy change and uh, education tool, because 
if we can get people to really understand food labels and read them, it's one of the best, it's the ready source of a material for the consumer. So Absolutely. tell us a little bit about that. Well, I can give you a, a high-level overview, and I'd be glad to follow up afterwards if, mm -hmm. if that would be helpful. But this is based on the, uh, the AI of, um, of potassium and, and looking at population-level data uh, and NHANES data, looking to see what the average intake was there. And, and so it seemed that there was uh, very uh, relatively little... Um, chance that there are people that might be uh, over, uh, uh, that there was n very few people who seem to be um, receiving the adequate amount and, and little chance that, that people may be, then receive too much exceeding exactly. So that's, and, and it, um, in order to be uh, a nutrient of public health significance, it needs to meet a very um, specific set of criteria, which I, I can follow up with you later. Okay. So, yeah. But I think that's another recent change in moving one of our nutrients of interest, that, like you said, the phrase of a nutrient of public health significance certainly is used in this setting and also is the kind of thing that informs things like what do we do with school, school meals and WIC um, and those kinds of things where they're, they're nutrients that have... Um, been designated of having more public health significance. Yes, Patsy. Haynes and for the Canadian um, Nutritional Monitoring, the type of assessment of sodium intake, dietary, urinary, both, neither. And in Haynes, it, it's both, um, but the primary uh, reliance is on a pair of 24-hour uh, dietary recalls. And it's important to stress that not all 24-hour recalls are the same. Um, the one that uh, the USDA developed, the automated multiple pass method, um, for normal weight people is within 3% of true energy intake. Um, people with increasing degrees of overweight increasingly forget what they've eaten um, so that it can be um, off by up, up to 20% in, in obese subjects. Um, but there is also a subset of um, NHANES um, that CDC collects um, with 24-hour uh, urines, and I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. So Dr. Molly Cogswell will be talking a little bit more about um, the data collection in and hence a little bit later today, um, including 24-hour year collection. Good. Thank you. Yeah, and certainly in the Canadian equivalent, it's, a, it's the double pass method that we use for dietary intake. So to clarify, it's exactly the same method. We've harmonized that. Yeah, the, I mean, there's some, some adaptations in the Canadian environment, but it's, <laughs> but it's the same basic method adapted for Canada. Excellent. Uh, any other questions from the committee? Please. Yeah. yeah, this is a question for Linda. Um, you know, we're, we collect all this information through NHANES or the Canadian uh, Community Health Surveys, and I know that the POA model, which is the population health model that you you indicated uh, was available, uh, does it have nutrition data in it? Can we ask questions of that particular model to say that if the DRA went from this to that, what impact it could have on other population aspects, population health aspects? Yes, that's a really good question. And um, I, before coming here, I was working with the person who is uh, Ron, Dr. Ron Wall, who um, uses this model. And um, he, we were actually trying to model that. So um, I do have some figures on that. But, um, you know, it's, we were just putting it together quickly. And um, it is something that could be uh, done. Very good. So we can follow up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, if there are no last questions, um, any last comments from our panelists to charge the committee, give us guidance? Okay, if not, thank you very much, both for sponsoring the project and for being with us here today.